Whenever the Morris Worm managed to gain access to a system, it would try, among other things, to determine the passwords of the users on that system. And by figuring out the passwords, the worm could effectively propagate further. Now, the approach that the Morse worm took is actually surprisingly simple. Namely, what the Morse worm did is mount what's known as a dictionary attack. Now, I actually did make uh, some other videos that describe dictionary attacks in more general terms, and you might want to refer to those if you are interested for some additional context. But basically, the Morris worm would look for a specific file that actually exists on Unix systems known as slash etc slash password. And this file slash etc slash password contains the names of users. It contains also, uh, in addition to their name, it contains their account names. It also includes a hashed version of their password. And you can actually think of a hash as a cryptographically strong, one-way, mathematical transformation of the password. If you're given a password, it's very easy to produce its hash. You're kind of going in the forward direction. But given just the hash, it's actually hard to invert the scheme. In other words, it's hard to go backwards and find the password that actually produced that hash. To bypass this cryptographic protection, the Morris worm actually tried to crack passwords by trying to somewhat intelligently guess what passwords the user might have been using. Now keep in mind that the idea behind a cryptographic hash function is that as long as the input is somewhat random and hard to guess, it should be hard for someone to go backwards given just the output. But if the input is not so random or might be somewhat easy to guess, as is often the case with user passwords, then you can effectively guess different passwords until you find one that matches. And so the idea is to guess a candidate password, compute the cryptographic hash of that password, and then see or check if the cryptographic hash that was computed actually matches the one that's in the slash etc slash password file. And if you do get a match, then you've basically successfully guessed the password. And so the Morris worm in particular tried some of the following uh, password mechanisms or password guessing mechanisms rather. Uh, first of all, the Morris worm tried to see if the user was employing the null password. In other words, in this case, the user didn't actually have a password, he just left that password field blank. And it's almost unfathomable to believe today that that would have happened in today's terms, but back in the late 80s, this was not so uncommon. The second thing the Morris worm tried is guessing that the user might have picked their username as the password. And a lot of people do this sort of thing. They have a username, they just simply take their password and make it their username. And so, for example, if the username happened to be J Smith, then the user's password might also be J Smith. The third thing the Morris worm tried is the username of the user concatenated with itself. So for example, if the username was again J Smith, then the worm would try the password uh, J Smith, J Smith. So basically J Smith followed by itself. The fourth thing that the Morris worm tried is the username in reverse order, in other words, backwards. So for example, if the username were again J Smith, then the Morris worm would try H-T-I-M-S-J, which is basically J. Smith written backwards, if I got that right. And then finally, the fifth approach to guessing a simple password taken by the Morris worm was to look at data that's taken from what's known as the GECOS field in the etc slash password file. And this field, this GECOS field, simply contains additional information about a user, like, for example, their nickname or their full name. And if you have their nickname, you can try that as a password guess. If you have their full name, you can perhaps try either their first name or their last name as the guess for the password. Now, as naive as these approaches sound, as simple as these password guessing approaches appear, they are surprisingly effective. And in fact, they were really effective in the late 1980s. Uh, that was a time when there was both less awareness of password security 
and also there were fewer restrictions around what the system would allow as a password. In fact, there actually have been some studies that have shown that, and these studies actually were done in the 80s, and these studies show that naive choices like the ones I just mentioned above could succeed up to 30% of the time. Nowadays, though, it's important to realize that most systems have restrictions in place that prevent users or prevent you from picking such simple passwords. So the likelihood that this type of approach taken by the Morris worm, uh, the likelihood that that approach would work today would really drop precipitously because of these restrictions on how passwords are chosen. In addition to the password choices, the Morris worm also tried a couple of other mechanisms for breaking the security of passwords. So first of all, the Morris worm also employed a special seemingly handcrafted dictionary of 432 words that Robert Morris Jr. had included in his worm. Now it's not entirely clear how he compiled this list of, of 432 words since it did contain some maybe somewhat obscure choices. In fact, I think it also contained a misspelling as well. But it's possible that maybe he had put that list together by analyzing other password files offline and then put some other interesting terms among the special dictionary of 432 words that he tried as different guesses for the passwords of the users in the etc slash password file. And then finally, the Moore's worm also tried to mount a more extensive dictionary attack by looking for a dictionary of English words. And it turns out that there is such a dictionary that can be found on Unix systems. Specifically, there's a file in many Unix systems slash user slash dict slash words and this particular file on a unix system contains a dictionary a fairly extensive dictionary of english words and so you can try each of these words as possible password guesses because people tend to choose passwords they can remember and in many cases they will tend to pick a word that is readily available or readily seen in the dictionary the way the actual morris worm was written it would take a very long time, actually about four weeks, to go through all of these more extensive password dictionaries and these more elaborate password guessing schemes. And because the Morris worm ultimately got stopped after just a couple of days in the wild, there was no instance of the original attack of the original Morris worm running in which this full dictionary attack was entirely completed. In other words, the Morris worm never actually completed in the time that it was running the full dictionary search of passwords. So hopefully this video gave you a flavor for how the dictionary attack schemes and the password guessing schemes worked with the Morris worm. And I'll continue to make some videos on other aspects of the Morris worm describing how some of these techniques were then used to make the worm propagate further.